Thank you all for being here today for this presentation. My name is Mike Galati. I'm a professor of anthropology and the director of the Museum of Anthropological Archaeology. Um, and I have worked in Albania for about 20 years. Um, and that's uh, one connection I have with, with our speaker, Chelsea West, today. So um, I'm very pleased um, to be able to introduce her. Chelsea West O'Hwery is a social cultural anthropologist and postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Population Health at the University of Texas at Austin Dell Medical School. Her research interests include race and racial racialization, belonging, marginalization, health disparities, and global health. She has conducted extensive ethnographic research in Albania, Southeastern Eastern Europe, and Central Texas. West O'Hwery is a native of Jackson, Mississippi. She received a BA with honors in anthropology from Millsaps College in 2008 um, and completed her PhD in sociocultural anthropology at the University of Texas at Austin in 2016. Her dissertation analyzed racialization and belonging in Romani, Egyptian, and Albanian communities of Albania. So that's the official <laughs> introduction, and that's the bio as provided by Chelsea. But now I want to give you the unofficial and unsanctioned um, introduction, because I've known Chelsea for a really long time, so I want to take this opportunity to really tell you something about Chelsea. Um, Chelsea is a pretty amazing individual. She has a history of taking the path less traveled. Um, she certainly does not back down from challenges. So for example, for those who don't know, she just gave birth to her second daughter, Amelia, who is here with us today. Did she step out? Was she? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so Amelia is here. So when you, uh, after the talk, you can meet Amelia. So if that's not a challenge, I don't know what is, but she did not back down from that uh, challenge of taking her infant from Texas to Michigan. Um, like I said, Chelsea went to Millsaps College in Jackson, Mississippi, where she grew up. Um, this isn't maybe on her uh, official CV, but she was the first African-American homecoming queen at Millsaps. Now, this might seem peripheral, um, but this was a really big deal, the first um, African-American homecoming queen in the 100-year history of the college. Um, and the reason this happened, I think, one reason, is that um, Chelsea is one of the most friendly people you'll ever meet and she's incredibly charismatic. Um, and the reason this matters, I think, is because this is what makes her such a fantastic ethnographer. Um, she's really good at her job. Um, and this is why she's had such great success in her career, her short career as an ethnographer. Um, I first met Chelsea in 2006. I was starting a field project in the high mountains of North Albania. Um, this is one of the most remote, even today is, is one of the mo most remote parts of Europe. Um, and uh, so uh, Chelsea was a sophomore, I think, at the time, um, was thinking maybe about uh, majoring in anthropology, and I, uh, I cornered her and I said, you have to come with me to Albania. And the first question was, where's that, <laughs> and why should I go there? And I said, I think it's amazing, I think you would be great, you should come work on this archaeology project. And she said, well, first of all, I don't think I want to be an archaeologist, I want to be a cultural anthropologist. Um, and I said, that's fine, no problem, come with me. Um, so she... Um, she came with us that, um, I guess it was our second season, actually, um, in uh, High Albania, in North Albania, um, and spent six weeks up in the high mountains with us, um, meeting people all over the Shala Valley. Um, and that's when I knew that we had a superstar ethnographer um, on our hands. Um, needless to say, I did get um, a call from her parents shortly after inviting her, saying, wait, you're taking our our child where, um, but, uh, but they quickly realized what a great opportunity it was um, and how dedicated um, uh, her, uh, their daughter was to anthropology, but also um, to the country of Albania. She returned with us in 2007 um, to work on an honors thesis, um, and she had become very interested in Albanian rap music, and believe it or not, there is such a genre of, as Albanian rap music. So she did a comparative analysis of rap in Albania and Tanzania. So after finishing in Albania, um, up in the mountains with me, she flew down to Tanzania with my colleague Julian Murkison, who's, uh, who's here, who was also at Millsaps at the time, um, and, and she wrote this amazing 150-page um, thesis comparing rap music in both countries. Um, uh, having finished at, um, at Millsaps, um, she received a Fulbright Fellowship um, and uh, went to Tirana, Albania to live for the year. 
Um, and I don't know if you're going to tell this story, so if you are, I'm, I don't, I'm sorry for stealing your thunder, but um, so she happened to be in, um, in Tirana when Obama was elected, um, and being the only African American probably in the whole city, maybe all of Albania, um, she was the prime target for interviews um, about, you know, the election of our first um, African American president, um, and I've seen some of these interviews, and they're amazing, and uh, by that point, Chelsea was basically um, fluent in Albanian and did all of these these live interviews about our election in Albanian um, on live television. So it was really, really well done. Um, uh, she, um, after finishing her Fulbright, went to the University of Texas, Austin to study anthropology. Now that anthropology program is pr perhaps best known um, for its African American and Africana Studies program um, and its Diaspora Studies program. And Chelsea, um, again, has these incredible stories about kind of walking around the, de the, the department and around the university, and when she said, I'm in anthropology, people would say, oh, diaspora studies. And she'd say, no, Albania. <laughs> and they would go, wait, what? You know, so, um, but she has really um, thrived um, working in Albania. Um, and uh, uh, she'll be telling you a little bit about her research um, there for her dissertation with Roma and Egyptian communities. Um, and I distinctly remember when she um, emailed me and said, I'm thinking about changing my focus to working with um, Roma and with Egyptians. And I wrote back and I said, wow, that's like, that's difficult. These are closed communities. I don't, I don't know that, that this, you know, this is probably the best choice. But like I said, Chelsea never backs down from a challenge, um, and she made it work. Um, and I know she's going to give an amazing presentation about um, her time with those communities. Um, she continues to go back to Albania. She's now studying the health um, system there, the health disparities um, uh, that are um, uh, to be found not only in her own health system, but the health system in Albania as well. Um, and so she's doing amazing, challenging work around health in Albania. Um, and I'm also very happy to say that she's just um, received um, a, a tenure track position in the Department of Slavic and Eurasian Studies at Texas, um, where she'll be the lone person doing Albanian studies. So, um, so I know you'll do a great job, Chelsea. So um, I'll get out of here now um, and give you Chelsea West of Hawaii. Thank you. That was a really, really, really nice introduction. Thank you. Um, though I have to say, thank you so much for that. I was the second black homecoming queen at most. I just didn't want to put that out there. I know there was, I, say, I know. It was, yes, people, yes. It, I, I'm not to, you know, um, play it down. But. <laughs> I just wanted, to, but thank you so much. Uh, thank you so very much, Mike. And thank you um, to everyone um, who helped make uh, this trip possible. Thank you for inviting me to speak here today. Um, and uh, want to reiterate um, for Crease and for the Department of Anthropology and those centers that helped make it possible. Thank you very much. Uh, so I, um, I will talk a bit, I guess, about uh, Albania and. Um, Mike already gave a lot of the history of how I got to Albania and how I got to this project. And um, also, I am very uh, wordy, so I'm going to put a timer on um, because I tend to talk probably too much. And I want to make sure that I don't uh, go over time. Uh, so I'll just have that there. Um, but the, so I. Um, in this project that I'm going to be talking about today, some of this work comes from a paper um, that I'm working to revise around uh, Roma and Egyptian populations and race and health. Um, and then others comes from um, what I'm working on my book, which is about racialization and belonging in Albania. I don't position myself as a Romani studies scholar or an expert um, in terms of like Roma communities and uh, Romani culture. Uh, rather, I um, am an anthropologist who uh, focuses on Albania, and I am looking uh, particularly at relationships between Rome's Albanians and Egyptians, but also I look a lot at racialization and categories, um, particularly around whiteness and blackness, and I'll be getting into that more. Um, I also, too, am an ethnographer 
Uh, and I know that that term gets used a lot more um, to kind of like a catch-all. Some people use it as a catch-all for qualitative research. And um, I am particular, though, about the type of ethnography that I've done, uh, really um, doing long-term and extensive work. So as Mike said, I've been traveling to Albania since 2006. And then um, I lived there for a year after college. Um, and then I also did some preliminary work from 2009 until 2012, and would go for maybe a couple months here, a couple months there. And then I lived in Albania again for just under a year in 2013 um, when I was doing work for my dissertation. And, and so for me, um, that type of ethnography has involved participant observation, um, you know, um, really uh, trying to build connections and relationships with people. Um, it's involved um, things like interviews. As, uh, also, I've done some uh, life history work. Um, I also would do the methods where I would do participatory walking with people and uh, walking through communities and gathering knowledge information from um, community leaders and interlocutors that way. Um, it's been a lot lot and lot and a lot of coffee over um, several years um, and trying to understand a lot of things about Albania and understand complexities. It's been a lot of family dinners and activities and uh, weddings and events and um, and so um, all of that has kind of have come, has kind of come together in the work that I do and present today. So when I share with you some ethnographic stories later, a lot of these have come from um, longer periods of time that I've put together. Uh, some have come from direct interviews. I've even done some things like focus groups. But um, but the work has definitely been um, over a long period of time, and I'm pulling it all together now to really try to think. Um, about belonging and marginalization, and, and, and also particularly thinking about race. So I uh, think about race and racialization um, as a way, uh, so not to think about Albania as, oh, let's use critical race theory or race thought and apply it to Albania, but really what can Albania tell us about racialization? And when I say racialization, I um, am not thinking about racism, um, but rather thinking about the processes that shape race and give it its meaning and its constant and shifting meaning and changes, right? So um, we have people like um, Omi and Wynette and um, David Theo Goldberg who've written extensively, these are critical race theorists who've written about the United States, who've written about uh, places like South Africa uh, and written about race in those particular ways. And uh, one thing that Omi and Wynette remind scholars is that to understand race though, you have to understand the particular social and historical context, right? So one thing I argue for Albania is that I don't take the definitions or as we might approach race in a place, say the United States, and apply it to Albania, but really think about, so what terminology is being used, um, how people talk about the word ratsa, which is your race in Albanian, but what other words and things that people use, um, how race itself gets indexed. I also, um, today, be talking quite a bit about marginalization and dehumanization. And so, oh, I'm sorry, before I go there, going back to racialization, um, Dore Bard and Dore Zez are two of my key concepts. So these are Albanian terms. Uh, Dore Bard meaning white hand or white side, and Dore Zez meaning black hand or black side. And uh, these are terms that um, are not, um, these are terms that get used really informally. Um, people will use it to reference, so, you know, for example, I was once doing, uh, having a coffee with someone who saw his, it was an Egyptian man, and he saw his niece with uh, a young Albanian boy, and he was like, oh, she's not supposed to be with Dora Bard, right? She's not supposed to be with those that are white. And so that, that's one example of how it gets used. Other times people might say, oh, um, if I'm talking to Romes and Egyptians, oh, us, Dora Zez, um, and then refer to Albania, them as you know, Dora Bard, right? But Dora Bard can also be Greeks, it can also be Serbs, right? And so, um, but I also try to pay a particular way to how it gets used in terms of whiteness. At the same time, there are also some people who use Dora Zez um, to be um, black and like a kind of a, so not just Romes and Egyptians, right, but also uh, people like me, people of African descent, right, kind of a catch all for blackness. And so I um, pay careful attention to how these terms get used. Um, I also, uh, thinking about, you know, Elena Lemon's work with Roma, um, when she talks a lot about how we can see the ways that race gets used because of recognition and misrecognition. And so, you know, some people have argued that race is not applicable to Southeastern Europe. It's not applicable to studies in the Balkans. Um, but I would argue, I would agree with Elena Lemon, argue that um, absolutely it's a concept that can be applied. It just, we might have to look for it and trace it in different ways. Um, and the same thing, um, David Theo Goldberg has this concept of racial 
regionalization. And so saying that in order to understand particularly race and racism in Europe, we need to think about a European region. And I would argue even further that Southeastern Europe, with its own context and history, needs to be thought about in very particular ways. Um, and so you'll hear me and talk as well, I'll get later into things like anti-gypsyism and um, that is also shaped too by the particular region of Southeastern Europe and in a post-World War II, post-Holocaust moment, right? So all that's very particular to understanding race in Albania. Um, when I say marginalization, I'm really thinking about those um, on the margins, but also that, um, or on the periphery, but that also includes the way that Albania is also on the periphery, right? Also marginalized. And so one of the challenges of doing my work too is that some people argue that maybe those um, in Albania are not able to perform a certain racial identity because they themselves are marginalized, right? And I'll get more to that towards the end of my talk today. Um, but that's something I take into account as well. And there's also a certain type of belonging or, and longing that I try to analyze and uh, what it means to be on the margin. And then uh, dehumanization is uh, a lot of language that I use. I'm gonna talk a lot today about the ways that people talk about um, feeling like animals, becoming animals, um, that happens quite a bit uh, with Rome communities. And this is shaped too as well by um, the Holocaust or as um, the Roma say, the poramos, which uh, was the, the devouring, right? Um, and so uh, really thinking about how that plays out today with Roman Egyptian communities. And I also wanted to note, when I use the word Egyptian, so it gets very confusing for some people because um, in Albania and in parts of the Balkans, so Albania, Macedonia, Kosovo mostly, there's a group of people that identify as Egyptian but not Romani. Um, it gets really confusing because some people have previously used the word gypsy as kind of a catch-all for everyone that might fall into this category. And then even the EU today has this kind of broad Roma traveler group that doesn't really help distinguish who people are. Um, Egyptians in Albania, though, don't speak uh, Romani or Romanes. They um, do not identify as having an Indian origin, but rather an Egyptian origin, and see themselves as a distinct group. There are many activists and scholars, though, who see Egyptians as Romes who forgot to, the Romani language and assimilated in a particular way. So there's a lot of tension around that. I treat Egyptians, though, as a separate group because that's how they self-identify. I don't actually enter into the debates around are they really an authentic group? Uh, but that's so I just wanted to distinguish that. And, and also to say, too, I'm not talking about those from the Egypt, like the nation of Egypt present day, right? And that also gets confusing for people. Uh, what's, key, what's key for me, though, is that both Roms and Egyptians identify as Dor, as is, um, as black. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to share some ethnographic stories, and I'll have these weaved throughout my talk today. Um, and I'm happy to talk about that type of presentation style in the Q&A, or, um, or um, the way to, like, um, this is what I'm gonna do, is I'm gonna have some stories and reflect a bit, and then tell you about the different concepts of how I'm thinking about racialization. So the stories that I share now will really get a little bit deeper into the dehumanization aspects. And then I'm going to talk to you about what I'm calling sites of racialization, so ways that I have ethnographically studied and tried to capture what's going on with these social processes around race. Uh, so I'm gonna start with a uh, small vignette uh, from someone by the name of Rigares. And um, so, Yam kafsh katu, yam si kafsh. I am an animal, I am like an animal here. Regeres yelled this as he stood outside of the street market, his arms outstretched, holding a small paper cup that he uses to collect change each day. His slightly torn denim shorts hung loosely on his body. He closed his eyes as he yelled, I am an animal in Albania. They treat me like an animal here. This is my life. The next piece is from uh, an essay that was written by uh, a, an interlocutor of mine, um, and as he describes what it means to be Roma. Two things define me as human, my name and my skin color that puts me in the category of the Roma minority. Sometimes I think that even animals are treated better in this world. I live in Albania, an ex-communist country where the education for Roma community is taboo. The majority, or as we call them, gage, are not used to seeing educated Romes with a bachelor's, master's, or a PhD they think of Romes as beggars, tin collectors, or fortune readers. I always thought that Roma were not allowed to even dream. 
On the other side, with my classmates, I always hear the dreams that the majority dreams about black music, about the black President Obama, or about black stuff. But in reality, Rome's in Albania are called Gabel, the nigga. They are denied even sometimes the ability to dream. Dreams are delicate and can die so fast because they need solid food. They do not have the ability to live just by oxygen. I have a big dream that one day I will strike the wall of discrimination and stereotypes in front of me until I break it down and take my plans for it to show the world that Roma are not supposed to or destined to have their dreams ruined, but they are worth being treated better than animals. And the last piece I'll share right now is from a neighborhood um, in Shkos. I am a Yevk and I am an Egyptian. We sit in the Shkos neighborhood inside of Flutura's family's barrack and she explains this to me. Several of us sit inside on top of thick blankets to the, on top of thick blankets on the floor. A large pan of green peppers rests on the small orange table. The family passes around the pan, putting the peppers on bread and topping them with tomatoes. There are only two plates, so everyone shares. Flutura has lived in this neighborhood for over 10 years. Her family used to live in a house in the La Proc neighborhood of Tirana, but after the collapse of the regime, she says they were forced out of their home by Dora and Barth, whites who claimed the rights to their property. Within a matter of days, Flutura says that her family found themselves homeless, which is how they arrived in Shkos. When I ask her what it's like to live in her community, she offers the following. It is difficult. Can you not see this? Do you think that it is normal for us, for blacks, to have to live like this? Without bread, without money? Where are men supposed to go? Out to steal every day? They spend all day in the trash, gathering cans. Is this life? Life is supposed to be lived like everyone else, having a job, having a house, your kids in school, that is life. But we live like animals. We are like animals compared to everyone else. And so I'm just sharing this picture here. This is uh, one of the couples from the neighborhood in Shkos. And so um, I have um, many different um, vignettes such, such as these um, where people are expressing articulating that they feel um, like they're treated like animals, that they are animals, that animals are treated better um, than Romans and Egyptians in Albania. And uh, this, so in this way, I'm trying to really understand how dehumanization gets articulated, um, but also how many Romans and Egyptians see their position. Now, this isn't to say that this is everyone who identifies as Rome or Egyptian, right? And this is also not to erase that there are many people who um, do have um, full employment, who do live in houses, who are you know, middle income, um, so that there's variation, right? Uh, but this is also a way of getting at how people are talking about uh, and using language of race, um, particularly using language of blackness. People um, like Olsi, who I read from his essay, are using that language um, to talk about the ways that he feels like you know, he uses the N-word, right? That's the word he uses to capture his position. Um, that's also very common. I run into that a lot in my field work. Um, and so I think that this opens a particular way of thinking about blackness, too, and anti-blackness, kind of on a global scale, but also presents challenges because if we're thinking about what it means for Romans and Egyptians to identify this way and use this language. But then if we open it up, think about the broader African diasporic work around race and social inequality, then um, there's tension there around blackness and the use of such terminology. Um, for uh, my next set of ways of thinking about race, I'm thinking about, so rug is uh, the Albanian term for road, and I'm really thinking about the road and the concept of um, as a way, as a particular site for studying racialization. And so um, I'm kind of thinking about living, collecting, and renewal. And so the road is actually where I've uh, done a lot of my research. A lot of this began by uh, walking and meeting people in the road. Um, because I would often walk the same path uh, wherever I was going each day, I'd run into the same people, and then eventually I started uh, building some relationships. And a lot of people were begging in the road or maybe washing car windows. Um, some people didn't have any housing in Tirana, so I'm, I was in the capital city in Tirana. Uh, it's about a million people. So Tirana, uh, Albania only has about a population of three million, and a million, a third of the population's in Tirana, right? So um, a lot of people, it's very congested, it's uh, very loud, noisy. Um, and um, at this time, this is or a lot of this research was done between 2009 and 2014. Uh, there were probably more people 
who were in the road on a regular basis. Uh, today, um, that the uh, state, um, the national government, as well as um, the local municipality are trying to enforce more rules about um, trying to make certain practices around begging illegal, um, particularly when children are involved. And so you may not see as many people that used to be in the road or they've moved to different locations. At the same time, though, there hasn't been a way of addressing the gaps and the problems around in, uh, around income and the lack of food and housing. Um, so at the, um, there's also been a push to declare certain types of settlements and houses as illegal or informal, and the uh, municipality has used that to build new roads and extend new roads and create new places. What that's done, though, is that, or sorry, new neighborhoods. What that's done is that that's displaced a lot of the Roma and Egyptians who live in Tirana. So I'm going to be sharing with you some uh, things about this road. Um, and also, um, there's a term, rugache, which means like street people but street, or trash or people who are not, um, are considered like a lower class. And so there's a way too that people who are in the road who are either collecting um, items from the trash or trying to sell secondhand items get termed with, with this uh, terminology. And that's part of a, of a regular experience, daily experience. And then Rigueres, who I read from, who said, I am an animal here. Um, I only ever encountered Regeres in the road. So over about a year period, um, Regeres and I would probably see each other, if not every day, definitely every other day. Um, but um, he, when I would always ask about where he stayed, you know, where he lived, he would just talk about wandering, right? So, um, and he would, at all times of night, be in this one exact spot in the road. So this, the first set comes from Schkoz, and this is the same neighborhood I was talking about previously. Um, this is a picture from 20, uh, this is from very recent, this is 2018, this was last summer. So uh, beforehand, those large apartment buildings were there and they were completely empty. And there were, there was like Romani and Egyptian camp here with mostly like tent and makeshift huts. But the municipality recently built uh, more stable units um, here, but um, they did not, so the, the government has paid for the units, but they don't provide the utilities, so oftentimes people don't have electricity and water is kind of iffy. Um, but, and then there's also, um, some people were able to get a couple of jobs, maybe doing street cleanup with the garbage uh, group that uh, does the garbage for the city, but most people still don't have formal employment, so there's a lot of collection that goes on. So this picture is from somebody who had collected items from by the riverbank and the trash and was gonna be washing them and reselling them, which is a common practice. Um, but the story I'm gonna share um, now came before the municipality built these units. So before people were living uh, more intense. We arrive in Shkos at the second to last stop on the Uzino Alto Tractore bus line. You might refer to it as the margins of the margin. It is the same neighborhood where Flutura lives. Passengers disembark from the bus. I stand in front of the six large apartment buildings. Chunks of garbage and crumpled paper clutter the muddy grounds. An older woman with a hacking cough is perched against a broken plastic table. The neighborhood is mixed with Romani and Egyptian's family who identify as Dora Zez. My baby died. These are the first words that Grace has spoke to me the first time I met her. Grace's baby, who was three months old, died about a month prior to our first encounter. He was too cold, she says, wiping tears from her eye with the back of her hand. He got sick because it was too cold here. Shpresa, one of the neighborhood leaders, explains more details about what happened, about the harsh winter elements and the lack of housing infrastructure in the camp, it goes. Grace looks at me, her eyes vacant, as Shpresa speaks. Grace is at least the third woman to lose a child during the winter in the Shkos neighborhood over the last two years. Grace's family lives in a makeshift hut. She's Romani and her husband Flory is Egyptian. Flory collects cans and scrap metal material but barely brings in enough money for food. And most meals consist of bread, maybe rice or beans on a good day. Grace is unemployed. They have three sons, ages 12, 10, and seven. Their oldest son sometimes beg for money and food in the streets. Her family has to try to find, her family has tried to find more stable and supportive housing, but they have often faced significant financial challenges. In addition, as part of the growing urban renewal projects, the municipality has begun to label more Rome and Egyptian camps as informal structures and illegal. This in turn has rendered numerous Romes and Egyptians homeless or indeterminately suspended and poorly resourced relocation settlements. A significant number of Romes and Egyptians are currently wandering, a complexity that calls attention to a constant friction, 
While the majority of Romans and Egyptians are seeking permanent and stable housing, they regularly battle the assumed notion that they are nomadic and therefore do not desire housing or don't want to live in housing because they're Romani and Egyptian. Grace often comments that no one cares about Romans and Egyptians, that no one cares about their current housing situation. No one cares about their experiences with homelessness, about her health, her well-being. No one cares about the loss of her child. She says that those who are racialized as white always speak badly about us. They refer to us with racial slurs. For example, if we are out to collect cans from the trash, they call us names. They think that they are higher than us. They have houses and apartments. We have umbrellas and tents to sleep in. If Romans and Egyptians could get jobs like white Albanians, then we could move up in life. We could do better. And so this is a picture, this is not from Shkos, this is from an area that was near um, the lake in Tirana and no, no longer exists. This is an example of what Shkos looked like as well. And um, this is from the back of Shkos. They're um, actually building a road now in that neighborhood to clear out space. And then this um, area here is near the train station in Albania, in Tirana, so I'll step back, or oh, I guess you can all see. Um, but, um, here at this station where this new road, a new highway, there was a Roma camp that looked just like this one. It was actually much bigger. It was pretty big and um, extensive and is no longer there. And so I, I put these pictures up to share uh, pictures of what some of these renewal projects look like. Um, James Baldwin once said uh, in the 1970s that uh, urban renewal was code for Negro removal. And I think about that uh, that concept. And again, though there are challenges with making kind of a blanket comparison between Romans and Egyptians and you know, black folk in the United States, what I'm also kind of looking at, though, is this um, anti-blackness and the way that a lot of these projects and these processes are similar and have a lot in common when it comes to particularly those who are in impoverished neighborhoods or communities and the way that displacement happens in light of this kind of you know, urban renewal or gentrification projects, right? I think there's a lot of room there to um, compare what goes on. Let's see. And then this um, is a picture here. So this family actually um, makes a little bit more money than some of the other families that I've worked with. They live in um, an area in Tirana um, that's near a neighborhood called Breglumi. And near Breglumi, there used to be um, more Roma camps, but they are starting to decrease in size. Um, but the two people that uh, sell here actually uh, do a lot of buying and selling and trading in secondhand markets, um, buying items and reselling them. Um, they also take in a lot of donations from people and sell them in the neighborhood. Um, it's a poor neighborhood in general in the city, um, but so a lot of people um, don't shop at the stores or um, at the form, at the more formal markets. They shop here. So this is where people would get their kitchen items. This is where they would get um, even clothes, right? So there's another section, another picture where there's a lot of clothes being sold. Okay. And so I will read one more, um, one more vignette from uh, The Road. She sat slumped along the sidewalk, head lowered. Maybe she was awake. Maybe she was sleeping. Walking past her at times, she could hear a very faint utterance. Please give me just a hundred leg. Often she did not say much verbally as she sat with her hand outstretched, head drooping down, chin near her chest. Her back remained against the large gate that surrounded the house of former communist dictator in Verhoja. The area is called the Bloc or Blaku, and under the communist regime, much of this area was off limits to most Albanians and was reserved for Hoja and top leaders of the party. Though communist rule officially ended in 1992, his house remained standing, enclosed by a large fence. Over an extended period of time, I watch her, this Egyptian woman, as she practices this daily ritual, not always the same time, but always in the same spot, right next to Enver's house. I recall comments that I've heard over the years, such as, when Enver was here, he did not allow people in the road like this. Enver was for us, for us Roma. Mehmet Shehu tried to ban us from the city, but Enver was for us Romes. Under communism, it was not like this. Under communism, we did not have a good house. It is not true what they say because during communism, the blacks were treated better than the white Albanians. So I share that um, ethnographic story and those um, sentiments because uh, in order to understand the particular context around race and racialization, 
it's very important to understand the communist moment and what it means. I think that post-communism itself is still relevant, and there's a lot of conversation around whether or not it's still a relevant concept. I think it absolutely is. Um, you know, could there be more dialogue and debate about how it's relevant? Yes, but I think it's still very important. And in particular, in Albania, there's a growing type of, um, and I, I, I'm careful with the word nostalgia, but there is a. I would actually rather categorize it as a type of longing for parts of things that were the way that they were. And I say that maybe a little confused. Using. But in particular, when it comes to some Romans and Egyptians, some people do believe that their lives are better because the state did operate or function in a particular way. Others felt that their life was way worse before. So there is no kind of uniform idea around this nostalgia or longing of things used to be better. But sometimes people um, feel that especially opportunities for them and their kids have been erased that may have existed previously and perhaps that was a job in the factory that was guaranteed because this is how the state operated but they see their lives as very different now and so this woman Fabiola, she would sit in the same spot every single day next to Inverse House as she and, and she begged for money um, with and her, her family members also were in other parts of the block. Um, and uh, she and her husband had tried to get employment in certain other areas, but they only had about a fourth grade education. And I always thought that um, in particular, her spot, that positioning right next to Inverse House, which is vacant, right? So the, the state hadn't quite, at least as of last year, hadn't decided yet what they wanted to do. But to see her next to Inverse House was, was, was a very fascinating contrast. Um, and so in her family, when I was in Toronto last summer, um, her kids are still, um, they still haven't found employment elsewhere and they still have to pay money of her food and a, some towards their rent. So this is, they still were in the block. And so I, uh, as Mike said, you know, I've been focusing for the past couple of years on issues around health disparities and race. Um, I am not a medical anthropologist, but I am very interested in the social aspects of health and illness. And um, in my postdoc, I've done a lot of work around um, health and the body. And uh, really thinking too, so on one hand about healthcare access and what happens in healthcare settings, but also to about notions of respect and what it means to be humanized in um, in terms of health. And so the uh, ethnographic story I'm gonna tell today is about Dita, a woman who lives in Shkos, um, really thinking about her body and how her body's been racialized, but also her body in terms of these social aspects of health and illness. Uh, so I'm gonna read, read a bit about Dita. She says the pain is an intense throb, her body is uneasy, and that she moves with zor, difficulty. Aphrodita, Dita for short, clasp her chest as she describes the pain in her left breast. I listen to her, but she does not think that I understand how much it hurts. I am sick, she says. I am in a lot of pain, she exclaims as she pulls her breast out and grabs it. Look at this. She squeezes it as large amounts of discharge come out, splattering the concrete beneath us in the alley behind the empty apartment buildings. I carry this pain. I carry this pain every day. Dita's barrack is positioned along the northeastern side of the Shkos neighborhood. She and her husband live there with their oldest son and his wife and kids, their youngest son and his wife and their two daughters, one of which is 16 and soon to be married to a young man from the neighborhood. A total of nine individuals with one on the way because her daughter-in-law is pregnant. They all share one long pallet against the wall. Dita spends her days collecting recyclables from trash bins throughout Tirana. This is the family's main source of income. Her husband suffers from alcoholism and is not formally employed. I work with cans, pushing around the wheels all day, she says, nodding in the direction of a dingy baby stroller that she uses to collect. On an average day, she begins work early in the morning, around 5 a.m., and she comes home around 3 o'clock, especially during the hotter months of the year. A good day yields about the equivalent of $7 in income, though sometimes she's able to make as much as 10 depending on what she finds during her hunt. Sometimes she doesn't find anything at all. Often she's able to collect used articles of clothing or shoes that she brings home in a trash bag, rewashes, and then sells to men and women who work in secondhand markets. I work all around Tirana in the trash, Elbasan Road, Student City, the Pyramid. What else am I supposed to do? She asks as she shrugs her shoulders and looks down. The work is not easy and it's not good, but what are we going to do? It would be nice if the state would create jobs or find jobs for us. When we do not have work, people feel obligated to steal. I work for one piece of bread. For one piece of bread, my family suffers, she yells. Get out, leave, you black gypsy. This is the kind of stuff that they yell at me. 
It's exhausting to live like this with 10, 12 people in my family. I work every day with sweat, with Zor, every day with difficulty. I ask Dita about the pain and her illness. She tells me that she is always in pain, but what can you do, she asks. She says that she recently went to the doctor and could not afford much, but they gave her some tablets, and she said that she would feel better soon. She pulls out this set of green tablets that she keeps inside her shirt. She's supposed to have another visit that she does not know if she can afford. And so um, this is some of the work that I'm, like I said, I'm working on in an article that I'm revising right now um, and really trying to think about, um, so again, not necessarily the concept of racism, but thinking about uh, racialization and what impact that has on the body. So um, Didier Fastin has done some work around racialization and the body, and um, it's really important, um, he argues, to understand the ways that race has um, rendered the body in particular positions and also as a violent social process, right? So there's ways that people um, are not just that there is um, inequality um, or social inequality and that sort of, and marginalization, but also this has an actual impact and effect on the body, right? And so um, in this case, I actually, when I met back with Dita a couple years after this, she still didn't have a formal diagnosis, but, um, and I, and I um, maybe should have given a heads up about how graphic <laughs> that image may have been, but, um, but what, um, unfortunately, because of her lack of um, access to care, um, lack of transportation, and also just feeling like that she is the one to provide for her family, she doesn't have regular doctor's visits. Um, even though there is a national program that helps to pay for health care, there's a lot of expectation that people are going to pay under the table if they want really good care. Um, and then also there is no mechanism in place to pay for medications that people might need. And then more extensive operations, right? Also, many Romans and Egyptians feel like they don't have access to the care that is provided through the government, so that even if there is a clinic that claims to offer services, they feel that either they're mistreated, they're unwelcome there, or they can't fully participate. And so when I last talked to her, she still wasn't quite sure exactly what was going on, but she did say she was doing somewhat better. And so um, the last, um, check some time. Okay, right, okay. Um, the last uh, segment I kind of want to talk about a bit in terms of Rums and Egyptians um, is really thinking about the Egyptian political party that's been emerging since, uh, or rather, it's emerged. It, it exists now. So um, when I was first uh, with the group in 2013, it was just emerging then. Um, but now they have officially um, the Partia per Europeanism, the Integrim Shipris. So the Party for Europeanization and Integration of Albania. Uh, and so this party. Uh, is, so this picture is not from that party. I'll explain the picture in a minute. But uh, this is a political party um, that was formed by Egyptians from Albania, I'm sorry, from Tirana and Elbasan. Um, there are people who thought that the only way to really mobilize and address the issues of Egyptians and Roms in Albania was to create a political party. They felt that going through organizations and NGOs was ineffective and not helpful, and so that there was a need to be kind of a party for us, by us type of party. And so I am going to read a bit from uh, a couple meetings that I went to uh, with this group and then also tell you about this picture here. Uh, this is from an article that was um, printed in a newspaper. And this Egyptian group here is a group of Egyptians from Albania and Macedonia who are trying to um, so they both want recognition from the nation of Egypt, so they want Egypt to formally recognize uh, the Albanian Egyptians, but also to be able to address these issues. Um, and so, you know, some of these signs, uh, like, you know, um, the Albanian Egyptian community wants equality, dignity, and rights. Uh, we want a strategy for national development. We want status. We want alleviation of poverty. And so uh, this was from a, taken from a, a conference that they had last summer in which they were trying to uh, mobilize for these efforts. Now, this group is not the political party, but there's overlap. A lot of the same people are in both organizations. Um, and this guy here, so Ruben Zeman, who is right here. Can we, yeah. Okay, he is... Um, uh, he is a scholar of Egyptian history and culture, um, Al Balkano Egyptian history and culture. He's based in Skopje, and he has written extensively and is one of the people trying to help mobilize efforts to address issues with social inequality. So I'll read a couple more ethnographic stories and then share my last piece and open up for a discussion. All the political parties eat our money. The white Albanians have political parties. They organize better than us. Egyptians and Romes, we only have NGOs. 
That's why we're forming a political force, a political party that will speak for Egyptians, Romes, and all the Dorises in Albania. You leaders are doing heroic work that is previously unseen here, a gentleman yells from the back. A round of applause follows. Some of those attending the meeting for the first time introduce themselves. I hear comments such as, no one realizes how big and poor we blacks are in Albania, and politicians want to smile with us for an EU photo opportunity or for political gain, but the next day they do not know you, they do not speak to you. In 2018, the English language newspaper Daily News Egypt featured a story about the Egyptians of the Balkans. The story was entitled, Balkan Egyptians to Homeland, We Belong to You. And the story main photo here featured Egyptian leaders such as Ruben Zeman and many in the photos holding these signs about the allevi alleviation of poverty, status, national development, equality, and rights. During my ethnographic research in 2013 and 2014, I regularly attended protests with Egyptians and Romes as they organized around the, as they organized at the Tirana municipal, municipality office. The language that people use is that of discrimination and racism against those that are black. In some ways, as Captain Baker argues in her recent book about race and racialization in Yugoslavia, race and racism are considered to be a subject of discussion in other places outside of Southeastern Europe. But my research shows that there are racialized constructions and formations that are local to the Balkan region, and these are tied to broader global formations. The current movement of the Balkan Egyptians could be seen, could be thought of as one of these racial projects in which blackness gets constructed and articulated in particular ways as efforts like this to mobilize and counter social inequality. And so, maybe, and if you've seen this video, I don't know if you've, uh, have you seen this video? No, okay, no, because it, it's been a very popular video in Albania right now. So um, I'm gonna share this, <laughs> I'm gonna share this video, but first I'm gonna tell you all a story. And, um, actually, no, wait, I'm gonna share this video first and then I'll tell you a story. <laughs> Um. Hey Liam, we love watching your films, and we think you're very talented, but this we got a bump because you. It's for Liam Neeson. You. Marco from Trubuya. You've made people of the world think that we Albanians are criminals, thugs, and always on the lookout for daughters to kidnap. Well, maybe it's time for us to show you our specific set of skills. Take you on the plane, because we think you will be taken by Albania. Hey Liam. Come and be taken by our spectacular ghost and our friendly smile. By our amazing history. By our traditional handcrafts. By our beautiful castles. By our fjords and valleys. by our glacial lakes. Come and be taken by our little Australians. By our graceful flamingos. Hey, Liam, hey, I'm a Chiprita for what we have on this song. You will be taken by the warmth and friendliness of all the locals. Yeah. I've been taken by the beauty of Uzumi Kenya. Now it's your turn. So if you're ready to be taken by the untainted, beautiful Albania, call us, email us, or just find us. We know you know how. Marco from Tropoya and his whole family will be waiting for you. <laughs> A friend gave this to me. It's Albanian. You mind translating it? As I told you, my dear friend, the house of an Albanian belongs to God and to the guest. Welcome. <laughs> okay, so there are many things I love about this video. <laughs> um, so in 2011, I decided, I was living at that time in Tehran, I was there for about three months, and I decided that I was going to take a trip and go to the northern part of the country in an area around Tripoya, uh, which is mentioned here and from the movie Taken, um, and I wanted to go through uh, Bayram Suri, which is a very beautiful area um, with you know, water and lakes, and, and I had been told by friends that 
if um, I got there, I could take the boat over, and then once I got to Tripoya, I could get to the city center and take a bus on to Kosovo, which is what I was doing on my trip. I was going on into Kosovo. And I was told by my friends, oh, yeah, sure, you're going to find buses, you're going to find fourgons, which are like minivan buses, no problem. And then when I got on the boat that morning before leaving the area near Shkodra, the person, um, owner of the boat was like, oh, yeah, you'll find buses, no problem at all. And so I get on the boat, a lovely ride across the water, and then we get to Tripoya, and of course, there are no buses. And so the owner of the boat was like, well, let me take you to the city center. I'll have my car here, and then there you'll find a ride. And so I got to the city center, and it was like a ghost town that day. And there was a coffee shop. There were a couple cafes. Um, a lot of people were doing pushim, like doing their break or nap. Um, but there were some people in this one cafe. So let me go over here. And so I go inside and talk to the manager. And the manager says, um, oh, yeah, ooh, I don't know. Like, he's kind of talking with me, maybe. But I think all the buses and vans are gone for the night. And then two men nearby hear our conversation. And they're like, oh, you can stay at our house if you want to stay. And I was like, oh, I don't, um, <laughs> I don't think I'm going to do that tonight. Um, and then I was asking, at this time, too, they were working on a hotel. But I don't know if it was done yet. And I wasn't quite sure. So I just sat down at one of the tables. And then I looked outside and realized that uh, in, inside and outside, there were no women there. And it was a much more conservative area. And then I saw two women come with a man, but they stopped short of actually coming inside. They stayed on the sidewalk. And the, man, the men came inside. And I thought, OK, I'm not supposed to be inside. <laughs> and um, I hear from behind me a man in English ask, well, what are you doing here? And I turn around, and I detected you know, a British accent. And so we started talking. And turns out he was Albanian, had been living in the UK for several years, but had come home for holiday. And he was so like, listen, I don't think you should hang out here. Um, I can't take you all the way to Kosovo, but I can get you to the border. I just have a family picnic that I need to go to, so I'll get, take you really fast in my car to the border. And then from there, you should be able to get on into Kosovo. And I thought, well, I think that's better than hanging out in this cafe. And he seems nice enough. So we get in the car, and he, we talk. He talks to me about his family's business in the UK, and we get to the border. There's a cafe at the border, because as you know, there's a cafe everywhere in the Balkans. And, and so uh, you know, I thank him so much for and his help, and he was like, don't worry, there'll be a car coming along, and maybe you can just hitch a ride to Kosovo. So the waiter comes out, I order my first macchiato, I pull out my notebooks, okay, I'll just wait and take some notes, and I'll be here. So an hour goes by, I'm seeing several cars come out of Kosovo to Albania, but not one car was going by, like no one. And then the waiter comes back for my second macchiato, and he's kind of looking too, like, hmm. You know, second his drink goes, second hour goes by, and at this point I'm like, I'm gonna spend the night in this cafe at the border, I think I am. <laughs> and then I'm sitting there, it's been almost three hours, and then a car pulls up, a Mercedes Benz, and a young guy, about maybe 21 years old, comes out and he says, hey, are you the black woman that's trying to get from Albania to Kosovo? And I said, yes, the, like looking around, like, yes, that's me. <laughs> and he said, my uncle's the manager of the cafe back in Tripoya. And when I got off work, he told me to come pick you up if you were still here and take you to Kosovo. And I was like, what? And then his brother is in the car and he's like, yeah, 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 come get in the car with us. And I thought, well, I, I, I guess I have to. And so. <laughs> And so I get in the car with these guys from Japoya, and they take me all the way to Jakob. And they were so friendly and so, I mean, I was just blown away by the hospitality. And I mean, as I retold this story, like years later to my husband, he was like, what? Like, you know, because I get in the car with all these people I don't know. Um, and, and I got on to Jakova and I got on to Pristina and went on with my trip. But I share this story and I shared this video because um, there's many times, um, there's an expression in Albania that some people have often said to me that Europe and the rest of the world have looked at Albania with a different eye, like Kaparn Shippardi may suit theater. And in other words, thinking like Albania itself has been marginalized or people feel like they haven't quite belonged. Um, people often tell me that I shouldn't be studying race and racialization in Albania because it's Albanians who've been on the receiving end. And so I don't do this work to to, to deny that, right? Particularly thinking about the experiences of Albanian immigrants outside of Albania and Greece and Italy. There's been a lot of work done around migration and belonging. Um, and I also, too, um, look at, like I said, the ways that the Balkans itself as a region has been marginalized, has been on the periphery. Um, and I also uh, do, ex I do a lot of work with Albanians and how they verbalize and articulate their experiences with race. But I often encounter, though, this, uh, a lot of rhetoric, too, that if we are this hospitable and this friendly and, you know, uh, the things in this video, how then um, can that be compatible with ideas around, around race and inequality, right? We just really think about, like, multiculturalism. And so one thing that I really want to push with my work is that 
I'm not doing this work um, rather to think about like how people aren't nice or not necessarily aren't welcome from a touristic standpoint, but to really think about social inequality and the ways that these forms of non-belonging are shaped by these larger racial formations and racial projects, right? It doesn't mean that that is in, that, 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 that that's incompatible with the hospitality, with the niceness, right? And I think more broadly, not even just unique to Albania, but on a global scale, I think there's a way that we can acknowledge the ways that such things happen, the ways that stories like that happen. I have so many stories of just this, you know, hospitality that's blown me away like that, and particularly around like me, my position as a guest, right, as a visitor. Um, and so, but, and I don't, I don't share the things around dehumanization or race to negate that, but to really try to problematize our conversation really about inequality and non-belonging so that whatever type of interventions or ways to address the social inequality can encompass all those things. And so I think going back to, you know, to the beginning, ethnography is really the perfect way to uh, really get at that because it takes a while, I think, to sit with these things, to really study those things that are deeply embedded. Um, and so I uh, wanted to conclude with this um, talk and also too because several years ago I was invited on an Albanian talk show and I was to talk about racialization and belonging but then when the show started they were like this is Chelsea and she is, says Albanians are racist <laughs> and, and, and immediately and the show was live I was like oh no I never said that you know uh, but then, so I was kind of playing defense the whole talk show um, but I wanted to uh, conclude there and so we can um, have Q&A <laughs> thank you Or, or yeah, I, I mean, you know, it's yeah. Thank, you can help, yeah. Go. <laughs> Do we have any questions? Yes, behind you. Anyone have any questions? Oh, mic. <laughs> and I'm gonna just take notes because I. Okay. okay. Yeah. Can is this on? Did I? Okay. Hi, I'm Christopher Stoyanovsky. I'm a PhD. I work with Elizabeth. And mm -hmm. I do a lot of work with Roma, Ashkali, uh -huh. Egyptians, um, in the intersection with like LGBT. Um, and I'm curious about like listening to you talk, I like recognized all the same things in like Serbia and Kosovo yes. and like uh, Macedonia. And I'm curious about how you couch your work in like the larger discussion of the region mm -hmm. and the region as this EU enlargement catchment area. Yeah. Um, yeah, and the kind of the sociopolitical context yeah. in all of this. That's a really, yeah, thank you. That's a really good question. Uh, so uh, in terms of working with uh, Romes and Egyptians, my, that work particularly around, uh, for that's gonna be in the book, the initial work is mostly in Albania. I did spend some time in, um, in Fushkashov, uh, outside of Pristina, um, and um, then in, in that area, um, there were a lot of Ashkali populations, and I immediately began to think, oh man, okay, this sounds just like what's going on in Tirana. Um, but I didn't have the right uh, means like to st I really s be situated there. And so I feel like in my next work, it's going to be a lot more comparative and thinking and drawing on experiences. And also there's a huge Egyptian population in Macedonia that I've only spent limited time with, but also have similar experiences around health. And when I was in, um, in Kosovo, that group that I was working with, the Ashkali group, was mostly women, and there were issues around reproductive care, reproductive, I'm sorry, reproductive health care and access. And um, I mean, the story sounded very similar. To take it a step further, though, in terms of like thinking about EU um, enlargement, I actually think even broadly than that, thinking on a global scale. So the data for Romani women in the Balkans when it comes to health care actually looks a lot like black women in the United States. Or you could also maybe argue too, black women in a lot of places around the world, right? And so the paper that I'm actually working on is um, people like uh, Teresa uh, Janovic um, have done uh, work around um, healthcare and access and uh, disparities. And so what I would like to do ultimately is to be able to bring that together into a conversation about um, health in the body and um, thinking about race and gender and how they operate in, in places like the Balkans. And then in, in these you know, kind of EU projects that mirror, I feel like, health and human services projects in the United States, right? Like the ways that these um, national and international bodies are trying to address what they see as gaps, but how these lived experiences would tell us a lot more than just some of the uh, 
some of the current work that's going on. And, and I also think, too, that there's been a lot of really good work by people in public health, but some of that lens can be expanded by anthropology. And particularly, in term, and like that's why I think ethnography can play a really critical role. And I think there's a lot of medical anthropologists who bridge both fields really nicely and are, are trying to do just that. Thanks, Chelsea, for your talk. Um, I'm wondering how geography plays a role in mm -hmm. racialization and marginalization for Rome and Egyptian mm -hmm. communities in Albania, because I think we've talked about this a little bit, but like among white Albanian communities, regionalisms is a huge way in which like racialization operates. The North mm -hmm. being stereotypically kind of tied to almost like an Aryan idea of hospitality, but at the same time marginalized, and it gets really complicated in white mm -hmm. Albanian communities. I'm curious how that might operate with um, Roman and Egyptian communities. Yeah, definitely. So what's really fascinating, too, is that so I also think terms like uh, malok get re or like reach out to that term. Um, could be like uh, for those that um, the words. Uh, actually, I once saw it translated as hillbilly. I'm, um, I actually don't know if that's a proper trans, but I'll, I'll go with that. But um, it's often used for people in from rural spaces, right? Um, and so uh, one thing that came to mind when you asked that question was in Shkos, there are also a lot of poor white Albanians from the north who live in Shkos. So that whole region actually gets stigmatized as like, don't uh, why are you in that region? Because it's like northerners. In fact, I was once inquiring about uh, apartment rates in that area because I was actually trying to get an idea about cost of living, but the bus driver was like, no, you don't want to live here. It's just full of northerners. Let me tell you where you want to live. And I was like, no, no, I wasn't trying to live. And they were like, let me just stop you now. And so then like the guy, you know, uh, guys on the bus were like, absolutely not. You cannot live here. And so then this conversation, and I was like, well, why can't I? You know, so then it opened up about these ideas about the north, right? So on the, and we didn't talk about this. Like on the one hand, people view those from the north as kind of like this pure sense of Albanians, but then they're stigmatized as like backwards. And that happens a lot to the broader community in Shkos, not just in the Roma camp. What also happens, though, too, is that sometimes people from um, Shkos that are Rome will say, oh, they're my look. Like, they call me Gabel, which is, you know, this pejorative. I call them my look, which is that pejorative. <laughs> um, and so there's, like, some kind of camaraderie that's there. Yeah. Um, that, I, that And that's not new, right? Any, people who've also done a lot of work around um, income and poverty and whiteness in the United States um, have also remarked about, like, you know, similar things, right? And so that's not um, unique at all. Um, also, though, the issues, so there are a lot of communities that were in Tirana and that previously had been in places like Elbasan or um, in Fear, or, uh, and, and these are Romans and Egyptians, who did not have access to jobs at all, even any kind of collection, any, any formal jobs. So they've come to Tirana because there's just opportunity there, even if it, that opportunity is like collecting the metal scraps. But, um, but the ways you see Tirana organized sometimes, like, oh, this is really people from Korcha and more elite, or from the south and more elite, and these people from the north or not, that kind of breakdown, I don't, I haven't noticed that as much in Roma Egyptian communities in Tirana, because it's kind of like, we're just all here. Does that make sense? But it doesn't mean it's not, that, that's not going on. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hi. Uh, so um, I, want, I wonder if you could talk a little about the difference between the concepts of nationality and race in, in your work. Mm -hmm. you know, in, in a lot of parts of Eastern Europe, there are things that look like racial differentiation, language of, bio, of a biologizing of difference, mm -hmm. the marginalization, mm -hmm. the linguistic um, stigmatization that you talk mm -hmm. about. Um, in the absence of any like phenotype difference in any like concept of dark and light, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and but yet everything else looks very much like race. But mm -hmm. the language they used to talk about is nationality. Mm -hmm. So are we looking there at a different phenomenon because of that different uh, mm -hmm. you know local term terminology, mm -hmm. uh, or do you or or do you think that the idea of race can help us think about these various? what we might otherwise think of as ethnic differences? Yes, that's a fantastic question. Thank you. It's one I encounter a lot. <laughs> so um, actually, yes, absolutely more towards the latter. I think that race becomes a concept that helps us think through ethnicity and nationalism. Um, I'm thinking back uh, because so one of the key differences is that, yes, there's definitely uh, like a biologizing of difference, but race also has a component around hierarchy 
that is not necessarily present with nationalism, right? And one could, and then, and then the question becomes, is that the case with ethnicity? Some would argue that yes, you could just use the term ethnicity and, and place and that race and ethnicity operate as similar concepts. But I would argue no. I would say that they um, are alike, but not the same. And that race itself, particularly in thinking about a post-colonial moment, helps us to think differently in ways that ethnicity doesn't necessarily do so. Also because ethnicity tends to be more about a, a, a self-ascribed instead of assigned identity, right? And not, not necessarily the case, but in many ways, one could inhabit multiple ethnicities and ascribe to them, but race also speaks to ways that these might be assigned, even despite one's own, like maybe one doesn't want to ascribe to that one. Does that make sense? And so um, a lot of the work that I've um, encountered around race helps though to think through ethnicity. I also think too, because in the Balkans, terms like ethnicity, ethnic conflict, ethnic hatred, are used, um, some would argue they're overused, and, and um, if we could think um, differently about formations, and I think that actually thinking about racial formations helps us to also break apart some of the things that just get called ethnic, right? So a lot of times people will talk about the relationships uh, between different Balkan countries and call it ethnic hatred and leave it at that. And I actually think that there's ways that people are being racialized based upon phenotype, but not just phenotype, other ways that they present, that they dress, and things even like smells or ideas about um, dehumanization and animalistic ideas, right? That happens a lot to Albanians. Uh, people would ask, oh, Albanians have tails, don't they, right? That, that was a com it used to be a common uh, remark made in parts of like Serbia, right? So, I think that there are ways that race allows us to get at some of those issues um, and, and, and that ethnicity doesn't always get at. Um, and to go back to your question about nationalism, I definitely think there's a difference between race and nationality, but nationalism is uh, playing a huge role. And then I, I um, will, I'll, I'll finish for now with this. When I did, once did a survey, I surveyed about 300 um, college age students in Tirana uh, around issues of race in Albania and um, and so on the survey, I had a question about Albanianness and Greekness, and the category of like Albanian and Greek, and whether it could be both a race, Albanian could it be a race, or is it just a nationality? And when I asked that question, it brought about a really unique response because people were talking about, would use the terms interchangeably, but I would say, is Albanian a nationality? Yes, like is it a race? Oh yeah, Albanians are race too. And so I'd say, well, are, um, can, are Albanians and Greeks of the same race? I'm like, absolutely no, right? And so the, it would be a very fast response. And so I think that question that I ended up doing on the survey helped to open, made me ask then, well, why, right? Because in the, in the category that we're operating with, in, in my case, I was thinking about whiteness. If they're not both the same race, or, then how are you understanding race and what makes them different and why they're not the same? And I think there's some ways that the analysis of race helps us think through that alongside nationality and ethnicity too. Thank you. I think we've talked about this before, and I may have asked you this question, but I want to ask you again, because yeah. I always think about this when you're giving your, your talks. Um, the concept of um, black and white, of bar and zez, mm -hmm. um, are loaded terms in ways yeah. other than racial. Yep. Um, and so they appear in the kanun, in the oral customary law code, um, and often they they describe, um, you know, whether someone is with or without honor, um, or whether someone's in feud or out of feud. Um, and so I'm wondering if for white Albanians especially, um, if there might be an overlay here of kind of issues of honor and what, what it means to be in their minds anyway, like a good person. Um, and so, or I could just be completely totally wrong. So you can just feel free to say if I'm wrong. Yeah, no, I think, I've, that's a great question. I think that there absolutely might be the case um, when terms like Dorazes get, um, blackness get deployed, I think that it's tied to honor, but also to, and this is something I um, am going to try to expand upon a bit um, in the book, but is ways that Albanians itself get, gets performed in terms of um, what it means to be Albanian 
that and so that debt that um it says that blackness not isn't always just tied to like a phenotypical blackness but like this person's not performing as an albanian in these particular ways around like honor around um, respectability around presentation um also too because if and you maybe, maybe heard you know very often there's a lot around theft and stealing so people would say oh our men are going to go steal if we don't have jobs or everybody thinks i steal things i think we still and so I think that that particular idea shapes a lot of people's thoughts about what it means to be Romani, right? And so th that if people can't be trusted, they're not people who are honorable people, then they might be cast as outside. And that might be apart from in how people might phenotypically present as darker skinned, right? And I absolutely think that there's some of that going on. Right, because Northerners often get painted the same way mm -hmm, by... Uh, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. By Southerners. Exactly, exactly. And so another example, too, um, I was once, um, actually Sylvia was with me, once we were on a bus and my wallet was taken and um, and I you know, was upset and you know lost money. But later on, I was at um, a friend's house having dinner and I told her what happened and she was like, oh, the villagers, the mountaineers, they did it. Yeah. And I was just, and, and immediately, and I was like, I, I don't know, somebody stole it, but you know, but immediate, but that was her reference point. And she was uh, from the South and she was like, you just ride the bus all the time, Chelsea, with those Northerners and they're gonna take your stuff. And that was how she used it. So that's, you know, one anecdote, but it's an example of what you're talking about in terms of the ways that, the, that those identities also um, are tied to this lack of honor or trust. Mm -hmm. yeah. Go ahead. I think that question that you brought up is like important too in terms of like, how does language mm -hmm. shape this work? And then also maybe even just as important or more importantly is like, how do you translate yeah. this <laughs> stuff like into the work that we do? Like the word tzigan in Macedonian, yeah. people will just say it's gypsy, but actually comes from like a Greek Byzantine word that means untouchable. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so like it has a much more deeper meaning yeah. than just gypsy. Yeah. And I think, and that's a really good point too. The word gabel gets used to um, Albanian term for Roma and it gets translated as stranger. Um, but in fact, it, it's a um, much more layered meaning. And many Romes today actually look at that word the same way they would the N word. Um, and then similarly, the word yev, which comes from yevjit, um, is used to talk about uh, to describe Egyptians, but it also gets translated to mean um, oh to mean black to mean um, I've also seen it be as well gypsy Negro the N word a lot and, and the same thing happens too with the word zezak or zezake which is um, comes from the Albanian word black right but also again it's what's used for all kinds of variations of blackness and those pejoratives. So yeah, it, you're right. And, and then even then, when you say like what the word means, there's an assumption to, this happens a lot with gypsy. People think, oh, I know what a gypsy is. And it's like, but, but there's so many connotations of what that itself means that, that's very loaded. So um, the translation can be tough. Yeah, <laughs> I'm working on it. <laughs> so I think we're just about out of time. I just wanted to make one quick announcement. Um, if you're interested in Albania or Albanian studies, um, you can shoot an email to albanianstudies at umich.edu and we'll put you on our distribution list. Um, so that's albanianstudies at umich.edu. So please join me in thanking um, Chelsea West for such a great talk. Thank you. Thank you so much.